All right, everybody, welcome to the next episode on the Mindful SRNA podcast. I am so excited to have Kyle here with us. He is a RN. He is now newly um, going to be starting CRNA school at the time of this recording, and he has got some major pearls and gems to share with y'all today. So I am super excited. So Kyle actually reached out to me on Instagram. It was literally two years ago, like two years ago in November, and he was kind of like, you know, I'm thinking about the CRNA thing. Like, do you think I could come shadow you? I said, sure, no problem. Because the key thing he said was, I want to know what it's really like to be a CRNA, right? And he was like, I'm still not sure if I want to do CRNA, but I want to go into 2022 with a plan. Like, I love that. Like he was the curiosity he had. So he ended up coming to shadow me came with tons of questions, was super prepared, super hungry. He ended up joining my CRNA roadmap program, utilized my interview guide. And just in general, Kyle used his resources. Like he used his resources. He networked with me. He networked with other CRNAs. He kept his head down for literally the last two years and just kept grinding. He always, when he messaged me, he's like, hey, I got a question or hey, I just want to let you know I'm doing this. I'm working on it, working on it. And then lo and behold, he finally got in. Right. And I remember he kept on responding to my Instagram post and he kept on saying, like, this is going to be me. This is going to be me. Right. And I'm like, and so I just want to say that to y'all is like, Kyle grinded. He used his resources. He reached out. He wasn't afraid to take up space, play big, and create the life that he wanted. But he started off with like, I want to make sure this is for me, right? That curiosity piece. And then he just kept going from there. And so we are going to literally dissect down what he did, how he's preparing for school and so many good gems for those of you who are still in the ICU. So welcome, Kyle. Thank you so much for being here. I'm just super proud of your journey and I'm just super honored that you allowed me to be a part of it. So I know everybody wants to know is what are your stats? How many schools did you apply to? Your GPA? Did you take the GRE? What kind of nursing did you do beforehand? Lay it on me. All right. Well, thank you for having me. First and foremost, Amanda, you were like the first CRNA who really set the blueprint for me when it came to like oh. just looking for schools. Like I saw the mindful SRNA on Google. I was always watching your Instagram. I'm like, you make it easy for people like me to be able to reach out and, you know, you're responsive and, you know, you're not gatekeeping, you know, so it was really easy kind of just to develop a rapport with you and we come from the same area so that that, that made it even better at that but um but yeah i need i know everybody likes to get into stats uh for this podcast i will get into stats i'm really not big on it but i will start with the gpa since that's like the biggest thing that nursing anesthesia programs want to know is how are those grades how are the grades right um so i'll i pull my vcu app that i apply with so i have all my fresh numbers that i came in with and this is what how i was stacking up against like I said, I started off in community college, so I wasn't the best student. I had a whole first year where my, my school was like, yo, you, you need to catch up. Like, you, you missed a lot of stuff in high school, right? So I, I went through some bumps and bruises, you know, from my first year of community college. I was having, like, C's. I retook psychology class, like, three times. Like, you know, I was just, just messing up, you know what I'm saying, that first year. But when I really decided I wanted to be a nurse, I, I started to get my grades right. So when I applied to VCU, my overall GPA from my community college grades, my nursing school grades, my RN to BSN, and my master's degree. And I retook three, I took three more classes too to kind of boost my application. Guess what my overall was? What do you think? I say three. Six. After all that. Three, six. <laughs> <laughs> Am I being generous? Oh man, you are being so generous. But I'm talking about overall everything. Overall, so like yeah. I said, I took a lot of classes, so my overall was three point one eight. Wow. And mind you, this is the best program, notably in the country, right? Yeah. And I had, I looked at my nursing cash GPA after I submitted my application. I was like, whoa, it's a, it's a three eight, three point one eight. Wow, like I don't even think I'm gonna do this. This is when the anxiety really set in. Yeah. But when you break it down though, because like you know, Amanda, you know, programs they want to look at that science GPA. You know, yes. how are those A and P's? How are those biologies? How are those micros? All those. So I can go through my science, my science grades to my science GPA. That was a much better. <laughs> it was a three point one A. But let's give it context though. Let's give it context. Yeah. Early on, you know, I had solid grades. When I was getting into nursing school, I at least wanted to have a B. So most of my science courses, I had at least or a B or an A when I applied to my ADM program. 
But I think the reason why my science GPA was so low is because I had so many science courses. I even retook chemistry three times to make sure I got that A. So you can see how different programs average different things. So what may be on the paper on nursing cast may not be what they're calculating. You know, they may just take the courses that you repeated, you know, so I really don't know what my GPA was, but you can go through my, my grades and you can see my sciences. I can go through my sciences. I had, um, at the time in the beginning, I would say my microbiology was a B. My biology was a B. I was, I remember when I was in community college, I was really good in A and P. And so I had an A and then I had a B and my instructor at that time told me like, Kyle, you're really good at this subject. You know what I'm saying? Um, and then you got the chemistries. Chemistry is always horrible. That's not my, my strongest point. You know what I'm saying? I had to take chemistry even in my, my, my R and BSN because I moved and I had to kind of get, you know, re I had, they didn't take my old chemistry. So I had a fundamentals of chemistry. It was a B went back to my R and BSN. I had to retake it for some odd reason. So I got an A in the lab, but I got a C in lecture. I didn't even know I wanted to be a CRNA. Yeah. So yeah. When I came time to I had to apply, I had to retake it again. And I made sure I got a full A this time and I wasn't slacking, you know? So all those grades put together, I only had a 3.18, but what I showed in, in, at the end of my, my application journey, as far as my grades was, I took organic chemistry, never taken it before. Could have got an A, but I had a B. I took pharmacology, got an A. Retook general chemistry, got an A. And then also during that time when I was talking to you and, you know, applying or whatever, I was in my master's program for my MSN in education. So I felt like that wasn't the biggest thing that kind of made me stand out. But I think it played a really big part because that lets them know that I'm ready for higher education. I can handle my DNAP courses at, the, at a higher level. And all my, my master's degree GPA, that was a 3.5. And in my R and the BSN, it was a 3.8. Even though those classes, you know, saying were kind of like, I'm not going to sit here and, you know, say like, oh, my GPA was this and I could get in. Like, no, like I had to do a lot of work, you know, to really make myself like, hey, I can handle this academically. Yes. yes. So yeah, and my grades, a, you know, went A at the end, but that they see the full picture of it. Yeah, absolutely. And I love that. And that's why, once again, guys, never, ever utilize my platform, the podcast, anybody's journey against yourself. Like that's not what I want you to do. We are here to just show you that there are different ways to get in for programs. But when you put your head down, you can come back from, hey, I didn't do so well in community college. Hey, I was a different person. I wasn't really, you know, I didn't know what I wanted to do, et cetera. You can come back from that if you do the work and show the school that you can handle the type of higher education courses. So I think that's amazing that you went the route to get a master's degree. And that is, you know, that is an option for some people as well. Mm -hmm. um, that wasn't even planned, by the way. I wasn't even thinking about being a CRNA. When I moved from, uh, when I moved, got out of the ER and I came up to the DMV area, I knew I, I wanted to do education and I was sitting on this thought process ever since I finished my bachelor's. So I was like, you know, I'm moving up here. I'm actually going to go for, I'm going to start my master's degree but well before I even thought about applying to nurse anesthesia school. So I was already completing that and because that was my path at the time. And then I flipped and I changed, but I graduated. You know, and, and in the grand yeah, scheme of things, that time. master's degree really set the stage because they can see that, oh, this person might be an educator or a faculty member when he graduates. So yes. putting that in context too. But anyway, yeah, go absolutely. Ahead. Yeah, I know. And I love that. And I think that's the thing too, is some people, because of their GPA, because of things, some people do get master's degree because of that to show that they can handle the workload. And I think that's amazing that that is your journey. So go ahead. So walk me through your nursing journey then. Your, walk me through your experience as an RN. So I uh, completed my nursing education at Julian Julian College in Illinois. You already know about it Juco. from the same area. <laughs> uh, so I graduated in 2017. Uh, 2016, I was a, I've been in the healthcare field since 2014. I started as a CNA, working in nursing homes, uh, leading up to getting into nursing school. So I did that for a year. You know, I was in the trenches. Don't let it be. Don't let it get it confused. I was in the trenches. I did that for a year. Got accepted on my first try to uh, my day nursing program. And like I said, it took a lot of hard work. I had to get the grades, just like CRNA school. I had to get the grades to get into that program as well. It was one of the best programs in the area at the time. Uh, so I got in on my first try and I got in, you know, I passed first semester and then uh, I had a bump in the road, you know, life was getting hard. And, uh, yeah, I missed my second semester by three points, you know, and I think that was the biggest lesson for me in my educational journey was it wasn't it wasn't the fact that I wasn't smart enough to pass my second semester. It wasn't that I was capable of handling the information. 
it was me. Like I, I was slacking, you know, and I didn't do a couple assignments. Right. I passed on my test. That's what's crazy. I passed on my test, but I, you know, I, I ended up having to come back the next semester and, and, and I finished and I completed and I graduated um, in 2017. Uh, for that half of the second second part of my program, I was able to work as a licensed practical nurse. So I was able to kind of get my feet wet with just the basics of nursing. Like I said, working in rehabs, nursing homes, things like that. And then I moved after I graduated. Three days after graduation, I booked it to Charlotte. And I started as a new grad on a post-operative surgery floor where I recovered post-trauma patients, post-general surgery patients. I worked on a primarily med surge floor. And I did that for about a year, but I always knew I wanted something more. And at this time, I didn't even know what I wanted to do with my, my life at that point. I was just glad to be out, out of the house on my own. And that was it. Uh, at the time, I was like, you know, I'm, I don't want to be a flight nurse. Or I was thinking about going back to school. So I was looking at, you know, BSN the anesthesia, BSN the MP. You know, but at the time, I was like, I, I desire a higher level of critical thinking. You know, I wanted to be those rapid response nurses. Okay, she's good. At that time, <laughs> all right, go ahead. All right, so at that time, I, I wanted to be a flight nurse. I, that's why I, my goal was committed to, and I knew I needed that ICU experience. I knew I at least needed three years of experience to even have a shot. So ever since my first year, I, uh, I transferred to the MICU, and I was, in, uh, I, you know, I say, I'm trying to be good at positive self talk, but back then I was not ready for the ICU. I was not in a good mental space. I wasn't ready to handle those kind of critical care patients. You know, part of it was me and part of it was my management and my leadership at the time. I didn't really feel like I had the good, solid ground and foundation and the support to be a newer nurse in the ICU. I feel like they kind of expected me to come up in there and, oh, you know, he's good references. We see this on paper, you know, solid med surge nurse. We can train. We can, we can do this. We can work with this. But I don't think they really knew how to kind of handle me at that time. But also, I didn't really feel like they really gave me a lot of the educational skills and, and the teachings, like, you know, of the whys of things. It was kind of just like sink or swim kind of ICU nursing, you know. So I was just doing what I knew on the floor. And and I remember, you know, I'm going to be I'm gonna be raw here. I remember making that wood medication error. I gave Zofran and the preceptor was like, did you check the QTC? And I was like, what? Because I always gave Zofran post-op. So I never really thought about that. And, you know, she looked, she gave me this, she gave me this look of disgust. And I was just, I felt like the dumbest nurse ever. And going through my rest of my orientation to make you, I just, I was just silent as a rock. I just knew that I was trying to just survive each ship. And in the end, I didn't end up getting off, orient off orientation. They sent me back to the floor. Lord knows after that, um, you know, I thought about quitting nursing right then and there. I really did. I really mm -hmm. think that, you know, that situation really humbled me. But also, you know, I cried for a few, for a day or two. I really did. I ain't gonna lie, I cried. But, you know, I went back to my old job. And you know how embarrassing that is to come back to the floor like, oh, I guess you couldn't cut it, huh? You know how embarrassing that is. But, you know, I kept my head down for that next year because I knew I had a purpose for myself. I knew, like, I can't give up on my goal. I can't give up on my dreams. And so I spent the next year on the floor. I, was, I went through all the emotions, mad, sad, angry, whatever. Went through that next year. And then after that, I was like, you know what? I just changed hospitals after that next year. I got my CMSRN. They wanted me to be a charge nurse. Like I, I was like, I'm not invested in here. I love them as a staff, but I'm, I'm not invested in this. I, I want to be a flight nurse. So I changed my hospital. I stayed in the system, but I changed my hospital. I changed my environment. And mm -hmm. I, went to an, uh, I went to the a level three trauma center ER. And this is where I really got my shot at critical care, higher level patients, um, because my PD, my ER was like a pediatric slash adult ER. And this is where I really got my start. And I was like, okay, Kyle, if I'm going to come into this, I got to prove myself. So what I did was I was like gunning for the trauma base, gunning for it, gunning for it, showing I can take it. So I was really exceeding because I think with ER nursing, it's kind of like med surge, but on steroids. So I was actually, I was really excelling at that. But I think what I think I didn't do, I did do differently this time was I was studying outside of work. I was studying relentlessly for the CE and the TCR. And I was studying relentlessly. And they, you know, they let me get in the trauma base of six months. And I was taking a trauma assignments by myself. But I was doing that work on the outside and collecting all that knowledge so that I could be able to apply and be ready for those emergency situations. And I can prove to my colleagues, prove to doctors that I can I can take these patients. and. After that, you know, I spent another like like year ish, year and a half ish there, 
And around 2021 is when I moved to D- the DMV. And this is when you heard from me. DM- I was going to say you, you heard from felt me. my DMV vibes. I lived out there too. I yeah, love me some DMV. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I awesome. moved up there and at, I moved up there. Actually, this was actually during COVID when I was in the ER. So I moved up there to get a change of scenery out. I didn't really, I stopped liking where I was working. So I moved up there. As you can see, I'm a crime job hopper. Yeah. All right. So I moved up there, right. did, did an ER assignment, and um, this is where I, I knew I was like, okay, I got a year under my belt. I still want to be a flight at this time. CRNA is not even in the picture at this point, you know? Uh, so I was like, all right, I'm going to go to the University of Maryland and work in shock trauma. Like, this was one of my big jobs that I want. I went into the trauma ICU, but this time I was ready. I was ready because I had my CCRN already. was about to take that. I got that knocked out. So I had it before I even entered the trauma ICU. And from there, I... I was just excelling, excelling. But I think this is where the CRNA thing kind of kept in the back of my mind because a lot of my colleagues during my time in Baltimore were talking about going to nursing anesthesia school, you know what I'm saying? Where you're in in the nursing station, just hearing colleagues talking about, oh, did you get in here or did you apply there? You know, and I'm just sitting here like, man, I'm trying to be a flight nurse. I'm trying to do all this other stuff. I I ain't even stuck it, you know? Uh, But at the time, you know, this is where I just, I started seeing you on Instagram and you were just posting all the reels and uh, like showcasing the life of what the CRNA was. And I started doing my research too. And I think what started was I, I bought your mindful CRNA roadmap. So where yes. they, you know, you lined out like, you know, how to get started, like how to even start the process of looking at schools and are you yep. financially prepared and, you know, looking at my GPA and all those things. Like you had the workbook laid out before I even like asked a shadow, I was using that document because I was like, all right, I think I want to do this. But I need some I need some guidance. And that really laid the foundation for me of kind of seeing, like, could this be a possibility for me? You know, and I shadowed when I was in Baltimore. You know, I shadowed one time and I was like, all right, I shadowed on the Taver case. It was cool. It was four hours of CRNA. I saw the ACT mod. I saw the CRNA, the MD anesthesiologist, and I saw the SRNA. So I was like, all right, but they weren't really telling me the whys of things. So, you know, I really just didn't really think it was for me at that mm-hmm. point. And mind you, I bought your stuff at that time. You I bought did. your stuff. You did. Yeah, you did. <laughs> I did, but I put it but I put it on the shelf for a year. I I wasn't really captivated by the whole anesthesia anesthesia process. You know, so like I said, I kept back with my original dream. I want to be a fighter, so I spent a whole year in the ICU there. Um and then during that time, after like around maybe that next year, twenty twenty two, I left. I left, you know, I went back to the ER, just, you know, more personal reasons, went back to the ER for a contract. And then um, over that summer, I, this was still COVID. I was getting sick of the <laughs> ER. Like it, it was yeah. horrible. It was horrible. It was horrible. So yeah. I, I picked it back. I picked the CRNA thing back up there that next summer. Um, and I was, like I said, I started reaching out. I picked back up that, that CRNA roadmap of the uh, binder that I bought from you. And I started looking dusted at it, it again off. and I actually really, I dusted it off and I really started using it. Like I was kind of looking through it back then, but like that next year I was really actively using it. And that's when I really started to reach out like, Hey, like I want to do this. Like, let's do this. Cause, cause for me, like I wanted more out of my nursing career. And at the time I was looking at flight jobs. Cause around then I think I had like three years, of, you know, I, I met the requirements for my flight nursing applications. You know, I was thinking about it, but I was like the job, looking at the big picture and looking at where I wanted to go with my life personally and professionally, I knew yeah. flight nursing wasn't really the move because I was going to make less money and do have to have to do more, you know, just to make less money. And that, that, that didn't really sit well with me, even though it was my dream, it's what I wanted to do. It didn't really sit well with me. So I got back in the cardiac ICU. And this is where I really laid the foundation and in, in kind of being more well-rounded as a critical care nurse, because I knew how to take care of, you know, ER slash Mickey kind of patients. I knew how to take care of post-trauma yeah. patients, you know, working at one of the world-renowned trauma centers in the country, you know, so I was taking care of the sickest of the sick trauma patients in Maryland. Yeah. And, right. but I knew I needed some more experience. So I went to cardiac and I didn't want to do okay. CVIC like everybody says, like, CVIC is the best experience or whatnot. Like, okay, cool. Like, you know, you can recover fresh hearts or whatever, but you can still learn on Mickey. You can still learn on sick you. You can still learn in a burn ICU. You can learn in any, any ICU experience is good. And mm-hmm. don't let people tell you, you got to go to CVICU. I'm not a CVICU hater. I just knew for me in that, in that time, I'd rather take care of the cardiac medical kind of patients, you know what I'm saying? Because those patients, I feel like they have some more medical comorbidities as well as cardiac stuff going on as well. So I wanted that 
wide range because I still had the flight nurse thing in the back of my mind at the time, but this is when I was kind of really starting thinking about anesthesia at the time. Yeah. And so this is when I started shadowing and I spent another year, year there. And by that time I was gunning for CRNA and the next year I ended up getting in. So that's like my full nursing experience right there. I love that. Well, I first want to say, thank God you didn't quit. I'm so glad that like you didn't quit. And just to, just to kind of throw this out there too, is like when my first job as a nurse, there was like a lot of bullying and stuff there too. And like, and I just, but even like knowing you had to kind of go back and it didn't work out, like things happen y'all. But if you like have a just inkling in your heart that you want something more that you know, you should be here. Don't give up. Like, please, if you're hearing this, please don't give up. And I thank you so much for being so transparent and just sharing all of that, because you have a vast range of experience. You kept picking yourself up. You kept being like, I'm always going to go back to curious. You kept being curious about, let me look into this. Let me do this. You were, yeah. Like you were, I talk about that all the time in my coaching programs about like, you know, like you were really trying to, you were making good decisions that worked for you. And now you have this broad, broad range of experience. And I just want to say too, I was down the street and uh, I worked in Baltimore too. Me and Kyle are just such kindred (laughs) spirits here because I was down the street at Hopkins. And he was uh, down the street working over in shock, my little shock uh, friends over there in shock trauma. But um, because I, and just to say too, I had no cardiac ICU experience. There's definitely not a single thing wrong with it, but I was trauma. I did trauma nursing. That was all my critical care was in trauma. So oh, yeah. um, trauma through and through. Once again. Yeah. I was going to say, I'm like a trauma nurse through and through is like, give me a cordis, some blood, a level one, someone on the airway. Like I'm good. Right. So and we in it. Yeah. So yep. I just want to, so once again, like there are so many ways to get to CRNA, you know what I mean? And it's okay to question it and to wrestle with it and to not know until you know but once you know but once he did decide then he was in it so just you know be you will know when you're ready to apply and i believe that you will know when you're like okay this is for me but don't be afraid to do some wrestling with it and some figuring it out because there is literally no rush y'all i know you guys think there's a huge rust there's not in your own time right cohort right time all that good stuff. So I just thank you so much for um, sharing that. Out. It does. It does. Just keep it. keep going for it. So I just want to say, I'm so glad you did not quit. Um, so talk a little bit about, so I want to like kind of speak to the ICU nurses now. So talk to me a little bit about this first time, obviously did not work. You're transitioning into the ICU. What exactly made that transition work so for those of people that are transitioning from floor or er or something into the icu how did you kind of do that transition and um any pearls you have with navigating the icu when kind of crna is your dream because i know that can be a very touchy thing yeah i will say uh i will speak to the first part about transitioning from another specialty area into the icu i always tell people Drop whatever you know about where you co- where you're coming from. I don't care if you're coming from the ER. I don't care if you're coming from the floor. I don't even care if you're coming from another ICU. You got to drop what you know about the ICU because whatever ICU you're going into, it's a totally different world. It's a, doctors are different. Your nursing colleagues are different. Your management is different. The patients are different. The protocols are different. Everything is different. So you can't come like my, that was my mistake. When I came from the floor, I was doing stuff that I knew on the floor, you know, and I was just, I was in like a a repetition mode, give meds, whatever, do my abdominal assessment done. I was on autopilot. I didn't really have to do much thinking. So I think, you know, a good tip is come in with a fresh open mind. And I think you got to be that way as a a SRNA as well. You got to come in with an open mind. Don't think about what you already know and just take the guidance that you're getting from the, the people who are trying to show you the way. And you got to be discern what advice is good and what advice is, is bad, you know, when you, cause now everybody's going to have the best preceptor in the ICU as well. So you, I think that's the first thing you got to be able to know is how to handle the person precepting you, which takes a lot of emotional intelligence, which is what you talk about a lot in your coaching. And, you know, the emotional intelligence is everything. And you're not always going to mesh well with somebody when, when they assign you people, you know, to train you nowadays and co- after COVID, you get like four to five people trying to precept you in the ICU. It's not how you get that nice six months, get the same person, you know, everything is all, you know, lovey-dovey, happy relationship, you know, not everybody gets that, you know what I'm saying? And especially to my nurses of color, 
because I've, I've, I've seen it all. I've seen it all how, you know, nurses of color can be ostracized from ICUs. You know what I'm saying? It's, and that's just the, the true hard cold facts. You know, ICU is a, is a gatekeeping profession, you know? So if you want to get in, you got to do more. You got to set yourself apart from the other people who are, that are applying to the ICU, but also you got to be 10 times better as a nurse of color. That should just me being honest with you. So I think the, the tip after that, uh, being having an open mind is learning how to deal with your preceptor. Yes. You got to know your preceptor's expectations out the gate. If I could go back and even to my Mickey time, I would have, I wanted to, I would want to ask more questions about like, how do you like this done? Cause you know, us as ICU nurses, you know, we all were there. We like our lines a certain way. We like our patients a certain way. We like our sheets a certain way. Me and uh, the, the same already, way. CRNAs are the same exactly. way, so buckle up. <laughs> exactly. Buckle up. You know, say so every CRNA was a critical care nurse at some point. So I think that's also going to help me. And, and I'm glad I learned that was learn how somebody likes it done. Because you also got to keep the patient safe, but also like they're tr entrusting you with their patient at the end of the day. You know, you may have your own license too, but you guys are working together. So me, I'd rather know than not know. My, my second go around. So I was very successful for, with that when I went to the trauma ICU was I was asking more questions. I want to know how these nurses like it done on this unit, because that's the only way I'm going to be able to feel trusted, you know, and be able to take my own patients and the nurses feel highly of me is because I'm asking questions about how they like it done. Because like I said, you may be able with a preceptor who's been on that unit for like 15 years. So if you come up in there acting like you know what you're doing, even if you're ICU, oh, I do it this way or I do it that way it's not going to be a very good relationship between you and those other ICU nurse colleagues, you know, that, and that is just the cold, hard truth. But when you get off orientation, you could do what you want. It's, it's just that initial three months, you have to know what they expect and do what they expect within the confines of patient safety. Now, if they're over here doing rogue stuff, you can, you can push back on some things, you know, so I'm not telling you just to do as they say. But I'm telling you is like with the little nitpicky things that they're going to go back to their management and tell you, well, he did this this way or he did this that way. Just do how they want it. As long as it's safe, according to the patient care level standards and the protocols, just do what they say and keep it moving. And then third thing, like I said this already before, is you got to study outside of work. You got to study outside of work. You got to know your drips. You got to know your drugs. You got to know your patient population. I love that. And so I think I that's think, so yeah. key. Like, and I did that. I did that when I was working like on the floor in my new job. Like I was literally just hungry for information. I wanted to be the best nurse I could be where I was. And I strive to do that at every single job I had palliative care, med surge, telly, you know, it didn't matter where I was. I wanted to be really good at what I did. And I just was a hungry knowledge sucker. So, and everything he's saying, which he's going to find out soon, because he's starting CRNA school very soon, but everything he's saying, you can apply that to precepting and clinical and stuff like that. So those things literally go, it's like a two-way street. It's kind of the same thing dealing with your CRNA preceptors. For sure. Yeah. Cause I wanted to be that go, I, I wanted to be that go-to nurse. You know, I wanted to be that nurse on the unit that people went to. But like when they yeah. needed something that they know a patient was crashing, I wanted to be that nurse. I wanted to be as knowledgeable. I was sitting on grand rounds. I was paying attention. I wasn't sitting there, you know, on Facebook, Twitter while they were talking about rounds. I was attentive uh, because that also, if you're sitting there in grand rounds asking questions and you're advocating for your patients, doctors begin to trust you. Nurse practitioners begin to trust you. PAs begin to trust you. And they trust when you say, like, hey, this is wrong. Something's going on they listen to you. And that is really how you can command respect in the ICU environment is by doing those asking questions, being curious, going to rooms that you got no business in. <laughs> when yes. the code was popping off, I was, I, was, yes. I was like, if I could walk over to my patient, I, I was gone. You know, as long as my patient was safe, I was like, hey, like I'm going in and I'm jumping in and I'm in the mix because I think one CRNA told me also, um, Aaron Davis, he told me well, like a long time ago, he told me, you got to learn how to be calm in the ICU. And, you know, yes. me, I'm, I can be a personality sometimes, but his advice was so pivotal in my early ICU nursing days was because I was learning how to be calm amongst the storm. And the ER really helped me with that. I can, I can code the patient and I'm, I'm not, I don't bat an eye, you know, which is why I'm really doing good in my rapid response job right now. But being calm is my next tip for being good in the ICU because nobody wants to work with anybody who cannot 
control themselves emotionally. Yep. And be able to take a step back sometimes and see the bigger picture of things, you know, and be a sound vocal leader because you got to be that way in the OR too. When stuff goes wrong or a surgeon's yelling or whatever, I mean, you know, like you got to be able to control yourself. You got to be able to control yourself. So I think that's a big thing that I learned too, is just how to be calm in the storm. Yeah, I love that. And that's a skill, right? It's a skill that takes time to build. It's something you're going to be honing when you're in CRNA school, y'all. But once again, that just speaks to like doing this type of prep work now as an RN is so key. Like every point he made is exactly what y'all should be working towards and working on as you're going to CRNA. I mean, that is so crucial. And all of that is going to serve you very well when you get to the CRNA table and you get into school. Um, yeah. so when you knew you wanted to be a CRNA, how did you go about getting references? Like, how did you move in the ICU? Because I know that can be tough. That did you is, tell people? Was you it a secret? <laughs> um, me, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not one of those people that wanted to keep a secret. I don't care. I'm gonna be really authentic. I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you like, this is what I want to do. But there was also some situations where you got to use some common sense. You got to be tactful. So it be, when you utter the word CRNA and ICU, you are the other side. You're one of those. <laughs> You're one of those CRNA school dream chasers. So you can either get the good end of the coin is like people will support your dreams. And you can also get the backlash of that is like your nurse colleagues, they, they don't really mess with you like that or they may not give you the, the best assignments that you want, or you may get the scud of the scud, you know? So it, it, it depends on wherever you're at and whatever ICU. If you're in an ICU where a lot of nurses are turning out into CRNA school, you're going to get it even harder. And that is just being honest. So I think for me on my first ICU, when I was in the trauma ICU, I was at this point, I was still, I was thinking about it. I was thinking about it. We had a lot of colleagues coming from our unit and you know, all going, trying to go to CRNA school or have gone on to CRNA school. So at that point, I was I didn't really know yet, so I wasn't really talking about it. I was kind of like kept keeping my head down, kind of just you know like looking at my resources, talking to other CRNAs, and low key I was I was shadowing underneath the table. <laughs> when I was in Baltimore, I I emailed the department. I didn't ask my manager. I didn't ask no CRNAs. I didn't meet a CRNA on the unit. I I went down to the department. Actually, no, I lied. I emailed the department on Instagram. <laughs> I emailed the anesthesia department on Instagram, and I was like, hey, do you guys like allow people to shadow? And they were like, yeah, you know, like email such and such or whatever, you know, and, and they made me fill out some forms, give them some immunizations, and then they set me up with somebody for four hours. And that's when I shadowed my first time. And this is when I told you, like, I wasn't really pulled by it because I wasn't understanding what was going on. Like, I seen intubations and all that other stuff. I'm, but I'm like, uh, okay, all right, cool. Like, a four-hour case, I was like, it didn't really hit yet. It didn't really hit because the SRNA was just trying to focus on getting through the case. You know, but they asked me where I was thinking about applying. I was like, oh, I don't know, maybe Maryland, maybe whatever, you know, just kind of just throwing stuff out there. But during that time in the ICU, I was kind of just doing doing my research on it, you know, trying to just see, uh, going through your workbook, trying to see like what, how am I going to get to this point in my journey? Um, but what I really want to talk about is my cardiac ICU experience. So when I went to the cardiac ICU and I already had CRNA, like I'm going for this because this is why I'm going back leaving travel nursing, going back into cardiac ICU. So my interview day, I didn't even mention a word about CRNA school. Didn't even mention a word. I was like, I'm here to be the best cardiac ICU nurse I can be. And that's another tip I would tell people is like, when you're interviewing for ICUs, don't talk about CRNA. I will say that. It may feel a little dishonest, but uh, nursing managers, you never know what you're going to get. And most ICU nurse managers don't want nurses who are just going to come there for a year and leave, even though you can't really do anything about it as a manager. You know, nurses are going to do what they want to do at the end of the day. I know staffing sucks or whatever. Nurses are going to do what they want to do at the end of the day. But I already knew that because I've been in the game for a while. So I already knew, like, I'm not going to tell them all my dreams. And if, and if, and if I am, I'm just going to tell them I'm here to be a really good cardiac IC nurse because I want to be more around it as a nurse. That's all I told them because they don't need to know all that. All I need to know is this is what I'm here to do on this unit right now. And they hired me. They hired me. But when I got in that unit, I knew I wanted to go to CRNA school. So I even, not even off orientation yet, I'm like, hey, 
I want these higher level patients. I already have my cardiac medicine certification now, and I didn't even get off orientation yet. I had my CCRM, but I was already studying for it. Well, before I even got off orientation, I was already studying. I had the certification so that they knew I had the knowledge. I had the knowledge. When I got off orientation, I was taking those sicker patients because they saw and I was pushing for it too. You know, some people will get pushback, you know, from trying to get the high level patients if they know you're trying to go to nurse anesthesia school. I'm not saying this for every person in every ICU, but you will sometimes get pushback. And I've been asked, like, you know, what do I do? Do I stay or do I go? I think that's the big question. Like, do I stay or do I go to get my experience? So you, you got to really navigate it. To, you got to gauge your management because, like I said, you need references, right? I had one reference from my old job. She was a night supervisor. You know what I'm saying? We had a really good relationship. So as soon as you get in the ICU and you know you want to go to CR night school, develop those relationships. Like, be that go-to nurse on that unit. Because charge nurses are going to know. They manage the schedule. So you need to be that go-to nurse that's, oh, I'll take this patient. Oh, I'll take this admission. Just offer for it. Offer to, to do it. You know what I'm saying? Be helpful. Be resourceful. Like, hey, do you need anything? Go around the unit. Hey, do y'all need anything? Be a good team player. Because at the end of the day, if you if you want them to respect your journey and your dream, you got to also respect them like you in the trenches with your with your colleagues. Boom. So Ooh, yeah. they need to be yes. trusted. You in the trenches with your colleagues, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So I, I was always that team player no matter where I went. Um, and I just wanted to be able to have a good reputation with doctors, my my charge nurses, you know what I'm saying? I wanted to be that nurse to them so that they knew, oh, when Kyle's on the shift, oh, we're not worried about it. Like, we good. I want to kind of set that precedence every shift that I came in. And it ended up working out, but I hit a bump in the road, though. I'm not going to lie, I hit a bump in the road because this is when I started to really kind of see how sometimes people can get held up in ICUs that they had no business being in in the first place. Um, when I told my management that I wanted to go to CRNA school, and like I said, my cardiac ICU, they turned out, you know, quite a few nurse anesthesia students as well. Not in that hospital too, from the CVICU to CICU. A lot of people were going to CRNA school. When I uttered those words and I told my, my director that I wanted to go to CRNA school and I asked him if he could review my resume, he said, okay. Um, he reviewed my resume and he said, I think I'm going to need a little bit more time. So whatever that meant, you know, I was only there for six months, Amanda. So I respected that. I was like, all right, cool. Like I'm, I'm, I respect it. You need a little bit more time to write me a thorough recommendation. Even though the man took his time to critique my resume more than tell me, you know, I support your dreams. So you got to be mindful and really think about what people are telling you. Cause like I said, I was just as qualified as him. I had my master's too and everything at that time. But I knew deep down that, lo and behold, another six months goes by. My entire hospital system says, even my, my, I actually hear from my supervisors, they're no longer writing letters of recommendation for anybody. Meanwhile, you got people going to NP school with no problem, leaving the job, no problem. But for some odd reason, there's a lot of nurses on my unit, they, they, they all know we're applying for CRNA school, but somehow... They're not like writing letters or recommendations. So a lot of you guys who are in the ICU right now, you may face this. You may face this. So this is why I say from day one, you establish those good relationships in the trenches so with your charge nurses, your unit supervisors, the people who are going to go to bat for you. Because you never know what your upper management is going to do either. Yeah. So yeah everything would have been peachy solid. and gravy if they would have wrote me references, but they weren't. My manager, my nurse manager couldn't write me references. My nurse educators, they couldn't, their hands were tied, couldn't write me references. But because I was such that go to nurse in the trenches, my 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 supervisor wrote me my recommend letter of recommendation for VCU. And I just want to I want to like just hammer this home. You guys are going to get so sick of hearing me say this, but this is what networking is, and this is what building relationships is. It's not like yes, Kyle was like I want to be a CRNA. This is what I want to do, but he didn't run around and be like me 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 me. How can I get 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 get. He gave, 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 right? Building relationships is about adding value. It's about what can you do for the other person? What can you do for the team? What can you do for your manager? What can you be for your chargers? And mind you, you do not have to like anybody to show up in the way you want to show up at. You get to decide how you show up. So if everyone else yeah. is being crazy, and you're going to see this in CRNA school, right? It doesn't have to affect how you show up. He showed up. 
I'm going to be the nurse everyone's going to go to. I'm going to, he took, he basically took control of what was in his control. And that's what I want all of y'all to do, whether you're in CRNA school, whether you're thinking about it, whether in the ICU now, what can you control? How can you add value into this situation? And then usually, naturally, people are going to give that back to you, right? But you have to look at stuff, not what can I get? What can I give? That is the key of maneuvering in this anesthesia environment and critical yeah, care. I give and I gave. I, yeah, you're totally right. I mean, like I gave, but I gave a lot to that unit. And yeah. and that comes from I was precepting, you know, like they nurse anesthesia programs want to see you precepting. They want to see you being a charge nurse or whatever. They want to see you taking care of the high, the sickest of the sick patients in your hospital. And yeah. then when they came out with needing super users, I became a Zoll super users. I was an ACLS instructor before I even took that job. I love teaching ACLS. So I was like, all right, cool. I'm going to find something I'm interested in. So this is another thing, like when you're in IC, this is how you got to maneuver if you want to go to CRNA school. Do stuff like to add to your resume that's actually you, you're interested in. Don't just get yes. on the CLABC committee and be like, oh, like I was on the CLABC committee. Or, and then you're going to get to your interview and you're going to speak to it and you're going to be like, uh, yeah, we did this and this. They're going to see you're not passionate about it, you know? So me, I was like, I want to be a Zoll super user so I can teach the other nurses on my unit how to, you know, run the Zoll. Because a lot of nurses get intimidated when they see the Zoll defibrillator, you know? So I, I took that on and I added that okay. to my resume. I got experience with, you know, quality improvement. You know, I saw a need on my unit, which is what your DMP project is going to be on. You got to find a need, identify it, research it, you know, and disseminate your DMP project. So I had experience with that in my ICU. I saw a need where, like, I saw a lot of nurses who were young on my unit who were international nurses. They were scared to death during codes. They were not comfortable during codes. We had a lot of new grads. So I saw a need for that. And me, you know, I took it upon myself to, you know, go to my educators, go to my leadership. And I was like, hey, this is what I want to do. I want to start running simulations because I had experience with it working at GW teaching ACLS. And I went to our simulation department. And like I said, I'm emailing these people. I'm coordinating this by myself. And after a few months of hard work, I was able to do a quality improvement project with a few other of my colleagues that one quality improvement project um, award of the year okay. that, you know, improving yeah. mock simulations amongst um, new nurses. And nice. now it's like a, a state, uh, it's actually a, a documented thing. And it's actually a thing that's being produced in their new grad res- residency programs. And they're actually running the sims to this day. And they're not even there. So it's, wow. it's, it's, it's just making an impact. It's just making an impact. And, you know, like I said, I was an educator always at heart. So it was nothing. It, it didn't take me more energy to do all that stuff. Even though I wanted to go to CRNA school, I was having fun while doing it. Oh, love that. I say that all the time. Enjoy the ride to CRNA school. There's going to be challenges. There's going to be hiccups. There's going to be annoyances. It's not, it's probably not going to go exactly how you pictured in your head because honestly, that's just not how life works, right? We can have all kinds of plans and what things that doesn't work like that. But once again, add value. You have your own unique value. And I hope that as he's talking, you guys are getting ideas of where are some gaps that I can fill? Like, what is something I'm good at that I can do? Maybe you don't love educating, but you love kind of leadership things and doing other stuff, right? There's so many, there's so many goals in healthcare. Find the value that you can give. I like, I love that. Hope you guys are taking notes. Listen to that again and again. That is solid, solid advice. So really quickly, and then I want to have you guys give or have you give them a few interview tips as well. How would you say oh, yeah. that you prepared for shadowing time? Because I think a lot of people want to get shadowing. How did you prepare for that? Because you shadowed quite, you know, quite a few different people. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I shadowed a few different people. I think the first time I didn't really know what to do. I kind of just went down to the department and they started the case. I introduced myself and. And they asked me a few questions, like, whereas I think about applying, but I wasn't really, like, actively engaging with the shadowing. I was kind of just, like, there. So I didn't really get a lot out of it, you know? But the second time, um, like I said, I used your resources. You know, you had a, a document, if I can remember, about, like, you know, how to prepare for shadow time. I was using stuff from you. I was using stuff from CRNA Prep Academy. I went to Diversity CRNA, and I met a lot of CRNA. Well, after talking to a lot of CRNAs um, about shadowing, uh, I got some good tips that I can give y'all. The first thing is when you go shadow, introduce yourself, which you already know. Introduce yourself, you know, let them know what unit that you work on and really set a good example and actually be there and be excited 
you know, because people can feel the energy. Like, are you just there? Are you just to be there? Or are you there with the purpose? So be there, be energized, and be excited to learn from your anesthesia provider, whether it be a, a MDA or whether it be a CRNA, SRNA. Be excited to be there to, to learn. So my second time around, I, I I exuded that energy, and I got it back tenfold. So my second time around shadowing, um, like I said, I I emailed the car the anesthesia department at my cardiac ICU job. And they're like, all right, fill out these papers and come down. So I came down there. Um, and then the second tip I got is document, 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 document what is happening. And I, and I say that because we, a lot of CRNA programs wanted to see, want to see, have you shadowed. So if you say, oh, I shadowed such and such hours, you're going to get to your interview. They're going to ask you, so what did you see on your shadow day? Describe to me what happened on your shadow day. If you don't got no documentation, you have nothing to draw from because you're going to give a run of the mill answer like, oh, it was it was great. Um, we did. I saw intubation and and I saw the CRNA put the tube in and in whatever. Like you're just going to give some like really cookie cutter answer. You're not going to have any depth to it if you don't remember what you saw, what drugs were used, what tubes were used, what kind of anesthesia was was used. Like you need to document from point A to point B. I was behind my CRNA, you know, Melissa Dimon, shout out to her. She wrote another one of my references. She got me excited about the profession anyway, but um, I was asking them like, okay, what is this patient here for? You know, what drugs are you using? What type of anesthesia are we doing? You know, or, okay, we're doing a MAC case. And I saw her, you know, change from MAC to, you know, a, a general case like that fast. And she had the MDA come in because of, things were kind of going hard. It wasn't really working out really well. I can describe that. I describe, you know, what drugs were used. You know, I, when my pa the patient got hypotensive, you know, she had, you know, Neo, she had ephedrine ready. You know, I, I, I know what is actively going on. I know what type of case is being done. And I think that is the biggest thing is you, before you even say like, oh, I, if you have your phone out, tell them like, hey, I'm documenting what is happening. I just want you to know that I'm here and I'm present. I don't want you to think I'm texting or anything like that. I'm here just documenting what I'm seeing. Most providers are, are fine with that. You know, so because if you don't say that, people are going to think you're in there taking pictures and nobody wants to be get, getting fired over a person who's not even who are you <laughs> you know so doc, definitely document what you're seeing what type of anesthesia is being done anything document anything and everything without obviously violating hipaa you know because you want to know you know during the time where you're prepping for your interviews you want to know what you saw and you can you know refer back to it you know what type of anesthesia was done you can describe you know a act model versus um you know a crna only model you know you can talk about those things and when it comes to the interview regional anesthesia general anesthesia, MAC anesthesia, all those things you really want to know. Because then the, the committee is going to be like, all right, this person was paying attention. Yes, absolutely. I love that. Um, do you want to speak, since we're talking about it, do you want to talk about a couple more interview tips? Like what are kind of like your top two to three interview tips you can think of for people? Yeah, I say, uh, I usually like, like most people, they break it apart between clinical and emotional intelligence. You know, that's what a lot of people are starting to teach in their mock interviews. Mm -hmm. I will, I will definitely say one, do mock interviews. You have to practice, whether it's practice with an official service, practice with your nurse colleagues, practice anybody. with your personal people in your life. You can practice with anybody, anybody, because but practice with people who are trusted it will give you accurate feedback because i practiced with my fiance a few times and she was like kyle you say this a lot you say like a lot you know what i'm saying like she pointed it out to me but she was a trusted person that i can i can trust that information and i can clean it up afterwards you don't just want to practice with you know somebody who uh, maybe like who just got in is going to give you like a really cookie cutter answer you know what I'm saying you want somebody who's really going to critique you not somebody who's just going to be like, oh, that sounds good. Even though you just said like, um, like 10 times, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because they're trying not to hurt your feelings, but you want somebody who's going to hurt your feelings just a little bit. Because I think I had to get my feelings hurt a few times throughout my journey. Oh, yeah. Uh, and it's going to be a few yeah. more. Don't worry. <laughs> yeah. So you got to practice. Um, and what I, I think what I say is you need to practice in front of a, a mirror, videotape yourself. I use, utilize Panopto. And I was literally answering like, you know, what is dopamine? Or why do you want to be a CRNA? I was sitting in front of, and I was recording it, watching it back. I'm looking at my body language. I'm looking at the way that I'm speaking, my tone, my rate, you know, my my posture. All of those things really matter because nurse anesthesia faculty are looking at how is your body language? Do you do you exude a confident behavior? Can you deliver sentences clear, concise, and straight to the point, and not ramble? 
And because they're they're trying to see like how are you going to respond under pressure? Because the interview is pressure. Like you're signing up for something that's going to be three years of your life that's going to change your life forever. So how can you control yourself? And I think another big thing is learning how to control your nervous system, your parasympathetic and your sympathetic nervous system. It is paramount to learning how to control that. You know what I'm saying? Because a lot of us get anxiety. Our palms start to stretch. Like me, like I'm nervous. Like my hands start to get a little clammy. And I'm like, ah, uh, you know. But learning how to control that and knowing when to like kind of just like pause and take a breath. Because when they ask you a question, everybody feels like they have to just blurt out an answer. Like, oh, we did this and this and this and that or whatever. Like, what is Levofen? And then you're like, um, it, it, it's a medication that you're, you're just all over the place. There is no time limit to when they ask you a question that you have to answer. You can pause and take a second. Because also you're going to have to do that in the OR. You're going to be like, pause, take a breath and, and work your way through it. You know what I'm saying? If you're trying to fix a, a, you know, a patient complication or something like that, like they're trying to see and try to gauge how are you going to be in the clinical environment? Because they don't want anybody who's going to come in there and be a, a ball of mess, you know, and there's a patient on the table, you know, like that's what they're looking for. And that's all how I thought that was my mindset through all my interviews. That's what they're trying to see um, for clinical preparation. I would say, obviously, utilize your drug guidebook. From the Mindful SRA. I definitely got that very early on, and I was studying from that. Um, and then, like I say, studying from your CCRN. When you're on the unit and you got a different drip or a different drug that you're given or they're doing a different, you know, diagnostic modality, you need to be studying when you're on the unit. Don't just go in there and do your your, seven, your 36 hours for that week and, all right, I'm done. Like, make it purposeful. Be intentional. Really look at the chart and learn, like, why? how are they trying to manage this patient and optimize this patient? Because they're going to be in your interview, they're going to ask you, like, how do you treat shop to shop? Like, if you haven't done any studying or you're studying on a deeper level, or learning the mechanism actions of drugs, learning the pathophysiology of drugs and uh, not drugs, but pathophysiology of like disease processes and things like that. You're not going to be able to speak to it in an interview because you haven't done any of that prep work. You're just saying, oh, Levo raises blood pressure. Like, no, you got to get deeper. You know, you got to know what receptors does it act on, you know? norepinephrine you know it's an alpha and beta receptor drug it's an agonist it can raise your, your systemic vascular resistance you know and it's the first line treatment of patients in septic shock like ne learn everything or know everything but you they have to know that you can go deeper with the material not just know the surface level stuff that everybody knows yeah, absolutely and i like i always tell people too they have to see both emotionally intelligent and clinically, you have to paint the picture of what kind of nurse you are. Because if you don't tell them, they're never going to know. It is not your job. Never. People are like, I don't want to talk too much. I don't want to do this. You can still say a lot and be concise. But if you don't oh, yeah. explain to them how you show up to work, the kind of nurse you are, how you think, okay, like my high pressure alarm is going off in the vent. Okay. First thing I'm going to do check, look at the patient, right? Are they gray? Are they blue? Right. Like you, and you just have to show them your thought process, right? Like then you're you like, okay, I'm going to call yeah. this. Yeah. Walk them through every single thing. What are you thinking? Are they biting on the tube? Do they need more paralytic? Do they need more sedation? Do you need to suction? Like you just have to be able to walk them through that. No matter what question it is, you have to show them the kind of nurse you are. Because if you don't, just they're the just not going to know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. No one wants to hear just that. What are you going to do? Nobody don't wants say to hear that because you're about to be an <laughs> anesthesia provider. No, no. Nobody wants to hear that. You know, and yeah. I think for the emotional intelligence side of things is I never really took the time to actually know myself. You know, like I haven't, like before I even started this process, I never really thought about those questions of like, what are my strengths? What are my weaknesses? You know, how do I handle stress? How do, you know, I you know, manage my pitfalls or how do I come back from things? Like I really took the time to really ask myself, I wrote down on pieces of paper, like all the questions I looked up online, like emotional intelligence interview questions, took all those questions and I put them on a piece of paper and, and I sat there, I sat there and I answered them because I didn't really know, know myself at the time, you know, and now I know like what makes me tick or, you know, saying what gets me motivated, what gets me out of bed, what are, you know, the things that hold me up in life. You know, I really got to know myself. And I think that's another thing is in being authentic in your interviews. They don't want somebody in that is going to sound rehearsed. And I think that was my biggest thing in my interviews was I was really authentic and I was true to myself. And that's how you, I think you have to be because, you know, they, they can, they can see through b bullshit really fast. Yeah. And robot answers, you know, like just being kind robot of robotic. Answers. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, robot answers. And I think that's a, that's a big thing is really knowing yourself and taking the time to ask those those deeper, deeper questions about yourself. Because that's, that tells them that, that you're really in touch with yourself. 
and also that you you have good coping coping mechanisms and you know you're not just just the run of the mill person like they're seeing who you are as a person because you're going to be their colleague one day yep. so they want people that they, that they like for 3 years they don't want to go be stuck with somebody for 3 years that is going to cause their classroom hell they, you always have something going on you're always you always have some drama you're not really together you know in the ICU you don't really know what's going on like they don't want that they want somebody who's there committed has the grit you got to show those buzzwords like you always talk about it, man. You always have these buzzwords. I am committed. I am dedicated. You know, I am determined. They want to know that somebody's going to go through that program and be successful and graduate and pass boards because that's what their number one job is there to do. And that's the education that you're there to receive. So and they need to know that how. you can do it. Like showing, yeah, them, show how. them how Once you got again, the I'm dedicated. How? Show me. How? Right. Like we love speak to the humanness of everybody. Stories, examples. Like speak to that personal so statement. Important. Yeah, the personal statement. Yeah, you writing... gotta tell your story. Like, who yes. they know you? Yeah, they that's, do. That's a big thing. They do. They want to know who that. you are as a person. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we're gonna wrap up here shortly, but I want to say, when are you starting school? At the time of the recording. Uh, at the time of the recording, I will be starting school next week. I got orientation for my mm-hmm. first semester. It's front loaded program, so I'm really excited. As you can see, I got my apparel already. Yeah. So you know. It's, you know, it's been a long time coming, but those two years that I was that I was preparing to apply, it went by in a jiffy. So yeah, yeah. just goes to show that people just 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 wait on it. Just wait on it. It's coming. It's coming. It's coming. Right, I love right program, that. Right That's time. a great thought. Right it's program, coming. right time. Right program, right time, right cohort, right all the things. Yeah. I applied um, to nine schools. Wow. It's amazing. I applied yeah. to nine Cast, schools. I got turned down by, by many. Cast a net. Cast a net. Right? Don't just apply to one school. Yeah, you'll end up where you're supposed to be. And um, if you feel like sharing, is there anything that you are nervous about? Like, is there anything as you're getting ready to go, the moment is coming? Is there anything that you're kind of nervous about? And how are you working through that? I mean, that I've had nervous breakdowns for the past six months. <laughs> I got excited. <laughs> no, <laughs> I had like so many nervous breakdowns, I can't even count. But um, I think the thing I'm nervous about is can can I be better than I was yesterday? And I think also is, can I prove to myself? Because I, I think they wouldn't have accepted me if they didn't think I could do this. I always there tell myself go. that. They, didn't, they wouldn't accept me if they didn't think I could graduate and pass boards. So I, I just have to prove it to myself now. And I think that's the biggest thing for me is trying to prove it to myself, whether it's my, my habits, I'll, you know, my habits, day, day-to-day habits, whether I'm eating right, working out, sleeping enough, you know, whether I'm, you know, I'm really prepared prepared as far as having all my my ducks in a row is me trying to prove it to myself and i think that's the biggest nervous nervous factor is like am i prepared am i going to show up my best self because i know how i was in nursing school but i don't want to be that way in nursing school i want to be a totally different kind of student so i think that's the biggest thing is like i'm nervous about i'm not i know i can do the work i know i can go in there and be and be a good srna i know i can come in there and be a leader and be a, a good representation of my program i just want to be able to prove it to myself and that's my biggest hurdle I love that. And I like how you brought it back to you and you've said so many key things. I hope y'all are taking notes. Like I got to know myself, like you went through all those emotional intelligence questions, but you took time. Like so much of this is because like, you know, if you guys know me, you listen to me or you follow me. If, if you're new here, my big thing is like being able to stand on your, your worth and your foundation and not letting that be on, like, that's not touchable. Right. And knowing who you are, knowing that you are capable, being willing to be uncomfortable in order to do the hard things, but it comes down to you, right? Nobody, not blaming program directors or preceptors or anybody yeah. else for your performance. It comes down to knowing yourself, believing in yourself, believing in your capabilities and deciding how you want to show up and what kind of CRNA leader you want to be. Like that is like so crucial and so key. And I'm so glad that you touched on that, but I'm also so glad that you showed us what that looked like for you. And so I just commend each of you that no matter where you're at in the process, no matter where you are, like a lot of the stuff he said can be utilized no matter what, but really like a big thing in life is like, how do you want to show up and not giving up and not letting anybody else decide your destiny? Like he could have totally given up. Like I see you. I couldn't have it. I look stupid. I'm like, whatever, but it doesn't matter. And now he gets to serve people in another capacity and he's already served so many patients. So I just hope this is very encouraging for y'all to lean into your uniqueness, lean into who you are, lean into your journey and just continue to reach for your dreams because they are 100% totally possible, even if they don't show up in the way that you want them to show up. So 
Any last exactly. minute, anything you want to say before we jump off, Kyle? Uh, I think the last minute things I want to say is thank you so much for everything that you've done for my journey Aww. and that you will continue to do. I want to say thank Aww. you for that. I'm here for it. Uh, exactly. Um, and for all y'all, y'all going to know this podcast, like I said, the mindful SRNA, Amanda K, she's a great mentor, great yeah. person to shout out. You know what I'm saying? She's a hardworking mother. So I just want to give you that shout out and give Aww. you your flowers for that. Thank you. Um, and then for all the pre-applicants, uh, like I said, right program, right time. Just put your head down, do the work. And uh, third thing is go Rams, VCU. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. All right, y'all. I will see you guys on the next episode. I will link in the show notes where you can connect with Kyle. I know he's going to be sharing his journey. Um, you can see he's got a lot of really good informational, educational stuff on his platforms. So I will drop all his stuff. He's on Instagram. You're on Facebook. Um, he's got a blog. Oh, yeah. So we will drop all those links so you can follow him and reach out to him. Um, and I just I cannot thank you so much for your time. And I'm so glad that we uh, connected. And um, yeah, we'll be so in touch soon. All right. Bye, guys. Thank you. Bye, y'all. <laughs>